All right, everybody, welcome to the Going Ballistic Podcast. I have no idea what episode we're on. It has been so long since I've done one of these. Uh, I, I apologize every time, but I have a feeling that you guys don't trust the apologies anymore because it just takes me too long to get to each one. Uh, but here we are, and I have a surprise for everybody. I brought Jason back for our podcast. Everybody, say hi. Jason, say hi. Hello, everybody. It's great to be back. We have so much to catch up on, and we even, guys, before we started just recording the podcast, we're just trying to catch up on the phone a little bit, and the list of things we have to talk about is so long, we'll have to just split it into a few podcasts. So, first, how you doing, man? How's the weather out there? It is hot. Well, you know Phoenix, Arizona weather. The monsoons are here. <laughs> it's humid. It's nasty. Uh, I'm, I'm ready for fall, which won't hit us till probably November when it starts cooling down, but... Yeah, yeah, I've had enough of the heat and monsoons. I'm ready. <laughs> Dude, it was 81 today, and it was hot here. Yesterday was like 73 in Nashville. It's it's gorgeous, dude. Yeah, I think uh, today... One of these days, I'm going to get you guys to move out here. <laughs> now, today was, I think, 108 or 109, but it wasn't very humid, so it was nice. Nice and dry heat. If the end of the world ever happens... I expect you to make your way out here because we actually have like life and water <laughs> and, <laughs> and things. Going. We're, not, we're not in the middle of, of just a dead desert out there. So I, I sympathize with you. I miss the family. Uh, there's so many parts of Arizona I miss, especially getting up to northern Arizona. But man, Phoenix, forget that noise. Yeah, it's nice in the winter. That's all we got going for it, though. Yeah, you got that going for you. So for those, that, that, that one month of winter is nice. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> anyway. So we've been, we've been uh, not only it's been a while since we've done one of these podcasts, it's been a while since we caught up on how your projects are going. We, we covered your AR-15 project and in pretty good detail on, on how it worked out for you and how you built it. And I don't remember if since the last podcast we talked about your bolt gun, but you ended up getting... A, a great deal. When I used to work at Remington, we had an amazing sale going on that I think the Kleckner family <laughs> on the friends and family deal we had, um, I don't know if abused is the right word, but really took advantage of. Oh, I took advantage and of. And one of those things is, yeah, <laughs> somebody from finance at Remington actually said something to me like, you know, this is like the 60th gun we're shipping out or so, some obscene number. Um, I, hey, I'm sorry. The collector guys like to shoot. That's that's what we do. Yeah. Um, you ended up with one of the uh, bolt guns. Which which bolt gun did you end up with? So actually, um, that was for a buddy of mine, and he never shot it, never did anything with it. So I ended up buying it off of him for the same price he bought it for, and that was the Remington 700 SPS. All right, so for folks that don't know, the SPS is, it's a heavier barreled bolt gun. It's a Remington 700 platform. It's a heavier barreled gun. Sometimes they call them the SPS tacticals, depending on you know, what's going on. But it's not like necessarily a hunting level gun. They usually come in a Hogue rubber over molded stock. Is that what you had? Yes. All right, so step one, when you get a Remington 700 SPS or the SPS tactical or the AAC, whatever they call them, is throw the stock away. The stock is junk. Would you agree? Yes, completely. All right. Nothing against Hogue. Hogue makes some great products, but not for that gun. Um, it's it's so bad, I could take the stock in both my hands, just holding the gun in front of me, and twist my hands, and I could twist the stock. Yeah. You know, it, it's pretty flimsy. Yeah, it, it's kind of a filler, which... I won't even get into about how, how, how much of a waste that is to put on there. But the first thing you do is you take the stock off. Don't even shoot it with the stock. You will not be happy with that stock. Don't even try. Take the stock, put it on Gunbroker, sell it for 20 bucks to somebody else, and upgrade. Now, you can go obscenely high on the chassis systems. You can get a budget options. What did you end up going with on yours? I ended up getting the Magpul. Now, I've had... Good experiences with those. I've heard some great feedback. Are you happy with yours? Oh, I'm really happy with it. The only thing mine didn't have was the adjustable cheek plate on it. 
Um, but I really like. Yeah, but you can buy those aftermarket, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Or I could just get a, a pad for it or anything like that. And actually, so far it's been working out just the way it is for me. So I haven't had to actually do anything to that. Um, and I really like the fact that it converted everything over to a magazine-fed lower uh, versus feeding the 308 bullets into the top like a regular bolt gun. I'm torn on that. I honestly am torn. So I like the utility of having a detachable box magazine on the bolt gun. It's really kind of handy, except when it's not. So when you have detachable magazines you are much faster than somebody who doesn't have detachable magazines until you run out of loaded magazines. Does that make sense? As far as just throwing the next bullet in? Because I could still throw a bullet yeah, in. Yeah, or also just reloading. Yeah, you're right. Not just throw a bullet in, but also topping the gun, what I kind of call topping the gun off. So I had converted my 700 police to take detachable you know, box magazines with the Badger bottom metal and the Accuracy International magazines, which cost a fortune. This is before the Magpul you know, system came out. And after I did it, I almost immediately regretted it because the standard internal magazine is so handy from a tactical standpoint. Now, I know people are going to argue about how much faster the detachable magazines are. And again, I get it. And you are faster until you run out of magazines. When you run out of magazines, so if you only have two or three with you, it is so much easier for me to stare through a scope at a bad guy from a tactical scenario and one by one feed the rounds into the gun. And if I have to shoot, just slam the bolt home and shoot. Whereas with magazines, I don't know about you, but I always found to myself I had to take both hands off the gun and sit there and top off a magazine using both hands trying to look through the scope. Yeah, with the setup... And then put the magazine back in the gun. Does that make sense? Yeah, the setup I have, it's it's not a, a fast release, at least for me. It's kind of a... The way that that Magpul has that little plastic release lever, I'll call it. Um, mm -hmm. it. Especially being brand new, it's a little fidgety. Now, the one thing I have not tried is with a empty magazine in there, just dropping a bullet in the top and closing it. Oh, that, that will work for you. I've, I've tried that. It works. But the once you've done that, you still have to take the magazine out and then have to use two hands to load it. But you, you see can what still I mean? feed Versus one after another. If you just have an internal top, magazine, like you could keep the bolt to the rear. Right, you could do one at a time and just slowly one at a time push them down, and then if the target decides it's time to be shot, slam the bolt forward and shoot. Whether you had one loaded or three loaded. Right. You know, versus the other way. So I, I, I'm not saying one's better than the other. I just it was something I didn't expect that after I got the detachable magazine system i went wow this is really fast as long as you've got a loaded magazine handy but the second you don't have a loaded magazine handy it gets really slow all of a sudden right like it's actually slower than the other way so it was kind of a interesting you know didn't expect that so it's just something to think about folks don't do not immediately convert your gun just because you think it's going to be faster or better there's a lot of benefits to it i think on a hunting rifle it's my favorite to have a magazine now so hunting style rifles, I love a detachable magazine. I love the idea of being able to get back to the truck and pop a magazine out and take a round out of the chamber and be done and not have to cycle through the whole internal magazine. I actually think for hunting rifles, it's one of the best ways to go. You know, I, I can throw a small magazine in my shirt pocket then too and just have it ready to go. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's nice too because they don't stick out real far like the AR-15 platform. So they don't get in the way of laying down very much or anything like that. Um, Right. If you're going to use these, I strongly suggest people who have a five-round magazine yeah, that's what I got. in the gun when you're walking around, and then a ten-round as a backup if you'd like. Definitely. Yeah, I think... All right, so what else did you do to your gun? So we ended up getting the stock. Um, right now I have the uh, AC, AAC flash suppressor that came with the silencer that I have for the 308. I screwed that on the end. Okay, so the SPS had a threaded barrel on it already for you. Correct. All right. And then the best thing that you talked me into was my trigger. I cannot say enough things about how awesome that trigger from Trigger Tech is. And like I told you over the phone a while back ago, if they made it for other models, I would trade it out in every gun I own. That's how much I like it. Now, you have, <laughs> you have more experience in several different triggers, a lot more than I do. Um, I've shot my fair share of guns, but most of them are stock triggers. Uh, but I got to say yeah. this trigger 
is amazing. And my groups with that 308, when I took it out and finally got to shoot it, was spectacular. Dude, we need to get sponsors for this podcast because we we sell so many things like Trigger Tech Triggers. So we should reach out to them to tell them that. So, just so you guys know, Trigger Tech doesn't pay me money. They don't pay Jason money. Uh, I'll make some money sometimes selling them because I'll buy them as a dealer, but uh, that's the only benefit I'm getting. I, I'm The reason I'm a dealer for Trigger Tech Triggers and not any other triggers is because how great they are. Um, I've been a two-stage trigger snob forever. You know, I always prefer a two-stage trigger, but believe it or not, the trigger techs are so nice. They are so easy to install, so inexpensive. Just everything about them is so amazing. I'm a single-stage guy now. Those, those, especially the flat shoe. Yeah, I love uh, that. I always thought that was kind of gimmicky, too. I put a flat shoe in mine, and I don't want to go back. I mean, 100 and change... And in my opinion, you're getting the nicest quality, safest, best possible trigger you can get. So the their reason they're taking over the market and the reason that every custom manu, you know, rifle manufacturer and you know all these pro shooters are going to them is they're the best and they happen to be the cheapest. <laughs> I mean, God bless them. That's great. But you compare this trigger tech trigger to any of the top of the line jewels or timneys and things like that they're they're cheaper and they're just good dudes uh they're i i forget if i mentioned it it's been so long since our last podcast when i first signed up to be a dealer uh during the day i got a call back like at eight or nine at night and i was driving somewhere and i got a call from canada and i'm like who in the world so i answered it because i have clients all over the place and i'm talking to this guy at customer service at trigger tech and he's like oh i'm glad you signed up and any questions we can answer for you and this and that and i say well no and Next thing you know, we get into a discussion about import and export laws, and it's the CEO of Trigger Tech. I mean, the guy is sitting there late at night making calls because he said that he doesn't like to leave the office having any calls, you know, not returned. And just, that's the kind of service I get from these guys. So not only do they have a great product, they're just good people too. So don't buy it from me. It doesn't bother me. Go buy it from somewhere else. But you and every, I'm not kidding, single other person that I've, told to get a trigger tech has gone out of their way to call me and tell me how much they love that trigger well the most impressive thing about it i got it installed it like you said very easy to install and even where they had it set at it was when i first dry fired it i thought oh that is way too sensitive i mean if i drop my gun it's going to probably fire so just to test it i took that hoax stock screwed it back on and bolted it and smashed the butt of that thing into the concrete, and it never fired once. So I was really impressed oh, with that. Oh, no, yeah. So that made me really happy, um, and I, of course, took it back off, put the Magpul back on, and, and away we went. Yeah, the, the lightness they're getting, in my experience, has also been lighter than it feels, or it feels lighter than it is. That's what I meant to say. I will feel it and go, oh, geez, that's way under two pounds. And then I'll pull a trigger pull gauge on it, and it's actually over two pounds. It's just it's such a smooth design with that ball bearing in there that they're getting all the safety of tons of engagement between the surfaces, but they're getting the lightness. So, yeah, guys, get a trigger tech trigger. I, I will eat my hat if you don't like it. I'm not kidding. I've, I've now on probably 20 or 30 people I've told to go get it, and 100% of the time they come back and I love it. So good, good, good triggers. So what else have you done to it? What scope did you put on it? Um, talk to me about your experiences with it. Are you happy with it? Oh, couldn't be happier. So the scope, I ended up doing a Vortex uh, HST, just like uh, same scope I put on the AR that we built. Um, and I ended up getting some Vortex rings. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm, the rings I'm a little skeptical about. So the rings that I ended up getting, um, and now it, slips me the exact model number but they tightened with a half inch nut on the left hand side yeah and it almost seemed like it was starting to stretch a little bit and it it just didn't feel tight enough so i took you know of course the torque wrench and everything and every day for like three days i would retorque it and finally after the third day it it set and stayed so that was kind of my only dilemma on the rings. Mm. 
Yeah, it might have been stretching. That's kind of scary. Yeah, so I just went a little bit each day until it quit moving. You know what I mean? And it, it seemed you know, to be locked I'm in place. I'm picturing some of their rings. I've had that too. I, I swear I've had where I didn't take a torque wrench to it like I should have. And I just kind of torqued on it with a wrench, which is close to the same thing. Right. And, yeah, there's kind of a spongy wall to it. You know, I didn't feel like a a solid wall of tension. You know, I felt it kind of give a little bit more. So it might be stretching. Yeah, and it, it was kind of weird. you didn't get their so, premier um, rings. You got and their I, metal And I started with range, a wrench, right? and I thought, okay, something's weird with this. And then, of course, I broke down and bought a little inch-pound uh, torque screwdriver uh, off Amazon for mm, tightening good. the scopes. And that has actually been one of the greatest things I ever bought because I've never actually known how tight I've actually cranked something down. Um, yeah, which one did you get? Uh, it was a popular one, and I can't even begin to tell you the name of it right now because I bought it like four months ago. Okay. I got one off from Brownells recently, and I'm really happy with it. Just an inch-pound screwdriver, yeah. same kind of thing. It's like, you know, I, I way beyond needing to do this yeah it was a popular one it was like 50 bucks um it's been fantastic so yeah so we went with the vortex hst again um i can't i loved it on the ar uh for the price which is like 550 bucks uh it's been a great scope i've had no issues with it and you can't beat the warranty on it right and then, right. Well, good. All right. And so what are the results? You went out to the range. What are, what are you getting with it? So, of course, you know how hot it gets here, and it's really hard to go out and shoot without melting in the sun. So as it starts to cool down here in the next month, I'll get out and shoot it some more. But before it got really, really hot, uh, I was doing a, a measure out in Wickenburg. I threw the gun in the truck because I knew I'd be close to where I could shoot. Uh, went out, sighted it in, um, shot three groups of three and touched two bullet holes and just barely microscopically missed the third hole from all three clover leafing three times in a row at 100 yards. So I was... <laughs> pissed you off, didn't it? It did. But it was so close that I was... <laughs> I couldn't have been happier, though. So I was like, okay, this is awesome. Good. So then... Uh, no, that's a factory action. That's a factory barrel. Yes. You change the stock of the trigger, but... That's it. You know. Correct. So that was at 100 yards. And then before I left, I um, I'd bought that new Leopold rangefinder, so I was playing with that. I picked out a boulder at 500 yards and just cranked up 12 minutes of angle like we've discussed and basically shot seven shots and without walking there and actually measuring it. But in the scope, it looked like I kept everything within a softball. So... For just goofing around, I thought it shot amazingly. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that factory barrel. So people I know will get a Remington, and the first thing they want to do is change the barrel, do more a more quality barrel than a factory barrel. And one of one of the first pieces of advice I give is stop and go shoot it. You might get a great barrel. Now there's a great chance you're not going to have a super accurate barrel in that case you can replace it but you might as well shoot it first and see what you got it sounds like you have an accurate one yeah and i gotta tell you the the stock and trigger combination especially the trigger being able to not have that little bit of pull that throws me off a little bit you know um just not being as experienced yeah. mm -hmm. and it just right when i want it to fire it fires is i think a huge part of the success i had and as accurate as i was yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I've been getting uh, kind of inundated with gear lately myself. I uh, have had a quite a few manufacturers be very kind to me, and I'm very appreciative of it. I'm very spoiled. Um, with whatever gear I end up not using, I'll figure out a way to, uh, to get rid of somehow. Uh, SIG has sent me a their 2400 ABS, which is a kit. It's a little mole pouch that has the range, a laser range finder in it that has all the environmental sensors on it. It actually comes with a really cool tactical, I guess if you will, pen in there. They already have three batteries and little miniature Ziploc baggies for it. They have a magnesium 
uh, tripod mount for the rangefinder. They have a wind meter that plugs into your iPhone. It's a, it's a pretty cool little kit together. And this thing, I'm trying to, I guess, make sure I don't overstate it, but I don't think I can. This is the biggest technological advancement in long range shooting that I've seen yet. Uh, <laughs> It does everything. So already you have all the records and shooting being broken. You have people shooting better at further distances and things like that. And yeah, some of it's the guns and some of it's the bullets. Some of it's the ballistic software that we have out there. And what it all comes down to is technology. I mean, we're not better shooters than the guys 100 years ago. If anything, they were better shooters than we were. We just have better technology on our side. And one of the things for technology is knowing what the environment does to the path of your bullet and what your actual path of your bullet is through computers and software is just amazing. And the most accurate you could possibly get is to sit there with a, you know, a weather meter in one hand, a most commonly like a Kestrel style, you know, weather station wind meter all in one. So it does your temperature and barometric pressure and humidity and wind and everything like that. And then also use some sort of ballistic software, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, calculator that figures out with your ballistic coefficient of your bullet with all those current environmental factors and the speed of your bullet and everything like that what adjustments you should need to make at certain distances at that specific location so you have like a kestrel in your hand and, a, and an iphone on the other hand with running ballistic software and you're trying to figure it all out and a laser range finder that you're using to get a precise range to the target and then you're compensating for the angle to the target with that laser range finder you're doing all these things well, this SIG Kilo 2400 ABS does it all in one unit. I mean, the one thing the unit itself doesn't do is win. That's why they have that wind meter in the in that package that plugs into your, your iPhone. But I'd rather just leave the wind meter behind because I don't believe that the wind at your location really matters that much at all. You know, as we know, the wind constantly gusts and changes directions and the wind at your position might be straight left to right 10 miles an hour, but it's not straight left to right 10 miles an hour all the way to a thousand yard target. In fact, it could be the opposite direction completely. Right. So to me, it's more important to use your spotting scope to figure out what the wind is doing at different distances and not rely on a wind meter. So if I could leave one thing behind, it's the wind meter anyway. So this SIG 2400 ABS, I pull out, I, I range the target, in the laser rangefinder itself, it has all the weather environmental sensors. So it tells me the air pressure, it tells me the, um, the humidity, it tells me the temperature, it gives me the distance to the target, it tells me the direction I'm shooting so it can figure out the Coriolis effect and, and spin drift. It can figure everything out all in just one lays. And if you load your profiles from your iPhone apps, you download the iPhone app for it and you can add in your rifle, your cartridge combination, and then you can sync them with the laser rangefinder. You can sync up to three profiles. So I sync my rifle into the laser rangefinder. I can actually pick it up no matter where I travel. I can travel somewhere else in the world, land, pull up my SIG 2400 ABS, lays a target, and not only will it give me the distance to the target, it'll also give me the exact adjustments I need to make to my scope on my gun for my ammo. And if I was wrong, if it was wrong and I needed to do something different, in the app, it allows you to correct and constantly keep updating the true data. And by updating it with the real data, it constantly keeps making the uh, ballistic profile more and more accurate for that you know, particular gun setting in the scope and then the rangefinder. So it just gets better and better as you use it. It's amazing. I've been playing with it so far. It is so fun to pick it up, look at a target, and press one button and get exactly based on whatever the conditions were for my zero what i need to do now to hit that target um game changer is the best i can say now it's kind of pricey i mean you can find them in the real world for about 1500 bucks so that's a lot of money but when you consider buying a weather station ballistic software and a laser rangefinder, and it's all in one I, I don't think it's that bad so i need to get jason we need to get you one of these so you can go play with it now, we had discussed this earlier, and, and my question that I'm going to throw on here, which I don't know if anybody else deals with this, but for me, like when I use the Vortex website or anything else, it always is based on a 100-yard zero. 
Now my problem that I've had is, okay, let's say I zero down here in Phoenix at 100 yards, and I go up to Flagstaff, mm. and most ballistic software won't tell you that your 100 yards is off. It's assuming that you have re-zeroed at 100 with all the calculations that it gives you. Does this, based on your last information in your app, already know that, hey, you're going to be off two and a quarter minutes or whatever the case may be? So great question. And to kind of restate what you said in case someone didn't follow it is what you're saying is the ballistic software that you're seeing, like you mentioned going to Vortex's website. Guys, if you don't have the money or you're just getting started with this, go to Vortex's website and use their LRBC. They call it their long range ballistic calculator. It's a free ballistic app right on their website. You can enter all the data you need and you can print out everything. It's an amazing resource for you, even just to play around and see what happens to the different projectiles. What Jason's saying is, so I zero at Death Valley at zero feet sea level, right? And I go to Denver, Colorado and want to go shoot, that in those calculators, when you start looking at the distance and the environmental changes, they seem to only give you the environmental effect from your 100 yard zero. They don't ever seem to calculate the fact that your zero is going to be off. So what I mean is, yes, Jason can use the ballistic software to say, I wonder what I'm going to have to do at a thousand yard target in Denver versus Death Valley. But what if he just wanted to confirm his zero? If he shot at a hundred yards in Denver from where he zeroed it in Death Valley, it's not going to be the same. So that is definitely a fair criticism. Um, a few things solve that. One, the SIG does solve that because my understanding of it is it calculates your zero based on the actual environment where you're at because now you're not just calculating your zero by writing it down on a piece of paper. You're calculating your zero based on all the environmental readings you're getting from the device at that time. But two, if you, even if you use apps, like my favorite app for an iPhone for using uh, ballistic calculations is Ballistic AE that thing in there actually will have you enter the environmental data for your zero, or you can click a button that says take you know, the local data currently for your zero, and it has the environmental data for your actually shooting. So it'll do all the comparisons for you, but you're right. Some of the simpler ballistic software you know, solutions won't do that. And they're, they're always giving you the change that you need to make at distance off of 100 yard zero, and you're dead on. The 100 yard zero is not consistent if you're changing. Right, and I learned that the hard way when I first went to Flagstaff with that AR we built. I'm like, okay, I'm off a couple inches. What is going on? And then, of course, remembering what we discussed, I'm like, of course, I'm at a higher altitude. This is my problem. But all my sheets that I printed from the Vortex website were now, they were accurate after I re-zeroed. So I would have been off basically two minutes on every shot, no matter what the yardage was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Vortex was saying at this lo environmental location. So it's not just the location, it's also that particular environment. So I made up a term there, environmental location. This is what you're going to do at distance. However, it assumes that your 100 yard zero was done at that location. It doesn't allow for a third variable, which is and your zero was somewhere else. Correct. And I think that's awesome that that SIG takes care of that because that's that's been my issue is I'm like, okay, I have to re-zero wherever I'm going. Right. So if you guys haven't yet, and you have, I think they have it for Android too, go download the Ballistic AE app, even if you download another app. I've tried them. Um, I'm teaching a course here coming up, and I'm going to try and get everyone on the Ballistic AE app. I've even reached out to the guys just to tell them how much I love what they got going on. They're a good group of guys. It may not be the prettiest or maybe the most user-friendly. I don't know. I mean, some of the other ones seem like they might be a little simpler looking but I love the quality of the adjustments you get in that app. And for example, this one is when you do your zero, it flat out asks you, what's your environment for zeroing? And it calculates it going forward. So it just solves all this problem for you. So you guys should try that out. Now so last, it's pretty dang amazing. Now the last time I checked, they did not have that available for the Android platform. It was only for uh, iPod or Apple. Well, yeah, if you're serious about long range shooting, you gotta give up an iPhone. <laughs> you gotta get an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here comes another debate. We'll save that for another podcast. 
Apple versus. If we're Apple. talking about getting getting the right gear, let's just get the right gear and solve it. <laughs> okay, so if you guys want to get an Android, then you're not going to have software that corrects properly for else too. If you want to get an iPhone, go ahead. That's funny. Or just get a SIG 2400 ABS. That's right. Guys, I'm not kidding. It's amazing. Now, if you were to ask me, I'm going to pretend like since you're listening to this podcast, you're asking me which software or which device should you get. Um, another thing that is nice, Kestrel is hooking me up. They're sending me some some toys, too, to play with uh, just so I can get better familiar with their equipment. They have some amazing you know, wind meters that have you know, applied ballistic software already in the wind meters. Now... No matter how great they are, it's still using a user interface of buttons. You know, it's got like eight buttons on it. You know, up, down, left, right, and a center button. You know, trying to enter data and trying to figure things out versus an actual app, which is much more user, you know, intuitive and connects with the laser rangefinder. And you still need a laser rangefinder, so it makes sense to put it all on one. But I'm going to try them out and give them a fair shake. Um, but if you already have a laser rangefinder, you should probably just get a Kestrel. Right? If you have a good or a decent laser rangefinder, you might just want to get one of the Kestrel wind meters because it's going to have all the weather, all the applied ballistic software in it, all the everything, and you can use the two together. If you don't have anything yet and you've got the budget for it and you can afford $1,500, which is a lot of money, but I, this is a bold statement, but I believe you'll save that money. Five years from now, you'll have made that money back in misses you know, on targets or just not buying, you know, even more equipment or anything else because it's going to be so helpful for you for shooting. I would just get the SIG 2400 ABS. But if you already have either the Kestrel or a laser rangefinder, then don't get it. Just get the other missing set and you probably won't spend a full $1,500 total. Um, Vortex, speaking of being spoiled, sent me an amazing care package. Uh, they sent me a Razer Gen 2 a scope, they sent me a Ranger 1500 laser rangefinder, and they sent me one of the little recon monoculars. And the recon monocular is awesome. Now, the, it's a little cheaper, it's their introductory level you know, model. So it's to me, it's a no brainer. You want a cool piece of gear, go get the recon RT. Uh, I'm having so much fun with that. My daughter, my six year old daughter, is using it and having fun with it. It's a little monocular that's got a, a range finding reticle in it. And holy cow, is it handy! The belt clip looks just obnoxiously large and complicated, but it's not. It's actually really well thought out. It, it immediately snags any mole webbing. That's what it's meant for. So a bag or you know body armor or things like that just snaps on. And for so inexpensive of, a, of an item and small and lightweight, it's so handy just to grab it, throw it up to your eye, and you can spot with it, you can range with it, you can see what's going on. I love it. I'm probably going to buy myself the higher end one, which is the Recce. Uh, the Recce model is the nicer glass, the nicer everything. But, man, those are handy. And the Ranger 1500 for the laser rangefinder, it's fast. I just hold the ranging button down and I can move all over the place. Or even if the target is moving, get updated distances. So for the money... You might save some money getting a Ranger 1500 rangefinder from Vortex, which is super nice. Um, again, my six-year-old daughter uses it. She was using both laser rangefinders out to a thousand yards, no problem. She just picked them up and she was lazing targets and having fun with it. The 1500 is is really intuitive. It's very affordable, and with a Kestrel, I think you're at about 1,200 bucks together. Or you just get the SIG for fifteen hundred bucks for two. So I, I can't yet recommend one or the other, but I'm I'm trying them both out and I'll let you know. I actually have an elk hide uh, draped across my couch in my office. I'm thinking about taking that out to the range and trying to laze the elk hide to see what it does on actual animal skin to see how far it works. Nice. Um, but I'll let you guys know. Yeah. And one other piece of gear I got uh, is a little red dot. Have you tried a red dot on a pistol yet, Jason? No, not on a pistol. Although that Glock that yeah. I bought from you is set up for it. You're older than me, but man, I'm, I'm getting old enough. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I put, I finally converted to putting a little, you know, red dot reflex sight on a Glock slide. And it seemed hokey at first. And boy, was it difficult to learn how to draw and find the dot in the window. You know, there was an awful lot of fishing around to find the dot. But once I figured it out, uh noticeable improvement in my group size. I'm not kidding. Half the group size I can normally shoot with iron sights. It's amazing how much better it makes me shoot. Nice. 
um, I'm really becoming a fan of Red Dot. Oh yeah, I've I've taken a a box, you know, the cardboard box from from a box of nine millimeter ammo and set it way too far away, and shot at it to see if I could hit it. And walked up later and found a tight group on the box with a red dot. It's amazing how much different, much of a difference it makes for me. Now, which um, although again, it's harder to find. You got to get used to it. But uh, I've been using a Trigicon a dual illuminated, uh -huh. so it's half fiber optic, half uh, tritium. So it doesn't need any batteries, which is nice. But sometimes, you know, if you're inside looking outside in the bright sun, it's hard to find the dot. You know, things. it's not ideal, but at least it's no electronics. Uh, I picked up a new RMS that I'm in love with. Uh, so much so that I'm probably even going to sell my slide that has the Trigicon on it. Uh, it's called a Shield RMS. And Shield is a British company. I don't hold that against them. But it is, it is the smallest, lightest, thinnest. I haven't fully tested it yet, but as far as I'm convinced so far, the best little red dot you can get, and nobody knows about it yet. Um, I'll put it through its paces and let you guys know, but all the other red dots for pistols right now, you need to take off the gun to change the battery. So you got to like re-zero when you put it back on. Some of the simple things this has is like a battery tray. You press a button on one side and the battery slides out the other side. Now you only need to change the battery every like three or five years. But just the small details like that show me their thinking. Um, the sight itself is such a low profile, it actually works with the Glock factory sights. You know, most red dots, in order to get the dot on a Glock, to get the dots to co-witness, you need to put suppressor height, you know, sights on it, which are really tall sights. This thing not only works, is so thin, it not only works with the factory sights, but the rear of the unit is molded, or it's not molded because it's aluminum, it's milled into the shape of a rear sight. You can actually take your Glock rear sight out and it replaces your Glock rear sight in the unit itself. So it's so low, it co-witnesses with the little tiny factory Glock sights. Um, I'm kind of kind of loving this thing. Um, I'm going to put it through its paces. I'll put a few thousand rounds through it and let you guys know if I still think it's as amazing as I do now, but um, I'm kind of a sucker for it. You need to check it out, Jason. Yeah, I need to get one for my Glock 19. It's it's on the list. Now, I do want to take you back a little bit. You had mentioned the term applied ballistics when you were talking about your new toys, and we got into a discussion about this, so for the dummies of us out there, including myself, um, why don't you explain what that applied ballistics is? Because I was not savvy to the term or what it meant when we talked the other day. I don't want to sell up applied ballistics. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so there's, there's a handful of people that I would put in a category of kind of like leading the long range you know, a community right now. And one of them is Brian Litz. Maybe probably the top of the list is Brian Litz. He is a ballistician for Burger Bullets. Um, he is highly regarded as the ultimate authority in ballistics right now. And it's, it's uh, he's a nice guy, super smart, um, wish him the best. He has a company called Applied Ballistics. And what they're doing is they're doing things like coming up with software called the Applied Ballistic Software, which you're finding in the Kestrel units. You're finding the SIG 2400 ABS. But he's also publishing books and putting out data. And I bought them all. I actually put it up on my Instagram a little while ago. A picture of uh, the three books I bought from him with a comment that said, hey, never stop learning. Like, I'm not above reading other people's books, you know, and learning from them. But what he's doing is he's going out and actually taking real data from bullets and what they're really behaving like. So he's not trusting what a manufacturer is saying their ballistic coefficient for their bullet is. He's actually taking Doppler radar and shooting the bullets and getting the readings from the actual radar and saying, hey, you know, they say the ballistic coefficient is this, but honestly what we saw the ballistic coefficient was was, was this instead. And he's publishing all those for you. So in... The ballistic software I recommend, like Ballistic AE, when you go to load a, a bullet into their software to see what's going on, you can either choose the bullet based on what the manufacturer says it is, or you can actually click a button that automatically grabs the, it says LITS, 
and it just means Brian Litz. It pulls his applied ballistics data for the true ballistic coefficient for a bullet, and it's just insanely more accurate. I've never had um, a published ballistic coefficient be more accurate than what Brian Litz is putting out for the ballistic coefficients. And he has a whole book on it, and it's worth it just to get that alone. It is the opposite of what I do. So if you bought my book and you liked it, Brian Liss's books is the opposite. I'm not saying you won't like it. I'm just saying he geeks out into the minutia of everything, which is what makes his information so valuable, but also it might be hard to digest. So he's more of an encyclopedia for reference, whereas I will try to talk things through the easy way and forget all the minutia. His life is the minutia. Does that make sense? Yeah, but it, it was good for me to know because... I had no idea what that was, even when I saw that in as an option in the ballistics software stuff. I didn't know what Litz was because right. I'm not in that world near as much as you are. So that that was a great. Yeah, li- you just go go just go Google him and you'll see all the records he has and all the amazing stuff he's doing. It's, it's pretty cool, and he's got some good videos and some good stuff. I mean, go buy his books. Uh, trust me, I'd love for you guys to buy my book, but um, his books are great too. And now I own them. And I'm going to flip through them. I honestly haven't even gotten to them yet. I've, I've thumbed through them. And it 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 reads to me like a, a physics textbook. But it's going to help me with my second book. I'll, I'll give them credit where it's due. Uh, the, guy, the guy is the the ballistics guru of our time right now. So you should, you should definitely listen to what we say. I think I even mentioned him in my book about... You know, he, if, if we disagree, listen to him. <laughs> and uh, Sierra Bullets had actually had a very kind, they've been very supportive of me and my book, and they had posted something about my book for people, and one of the guys on Facebook had commented, well, how is this compared to Litz's book? And my response on Sierra's Facebook post was, I mention Brian Litz in my book, he doesn't mention me in his books. <laughs> so that should tell you uh, <laughs> that right there, so... I think Sig really appreciated the honesty, you know, the, the, the humility that I put there. So, anyway, that, that's what Applied Ballistics is. Check it out. That's awesome. So, something else to talk about now before we go. Um, uh, the Sig P320, that's their, their pistol that on which the new gun that the Army picked for the replacement for Army-wide handgun is based. Oh, I've heard about it's this. It's a striker-fired handgun it's a modular handgun um man it the reason this is a big deal to me is not only because i'm a big believer in firearm safety and things like that but also i happen to be a firearms attorney and the whole uh liability recalls safety things just can, can drive me nuts with manufacturers and this one does and loving the company for what they're doing with their rangefinders. Uh, I have uh, a handful of people that I know personally that I consider good friends that work with SIG. I know it's good people. I I know it's a good company. But, man, um, as of today, this is kind of a textbook way of not to handle a product safety issue or a liability or a recall issue in my book. What happened is the P320, which won over the Glock for the Army handgun test, which I was wrong on. I admitted that I was wrong publicly. On my Facebook, you can see me on there saying, uh, completely caught me by surprise. I was, I completely was wrong. I thought the Glock was going to win hands down. Now that's because, though, I have too many people on the inside for the government testing that are giving me feedback. So I actually had too much inside information that led me down the wrong path because I know from the feedback I was getting from these folks, the Glock was supremely surpassing the SIG in performance. Um, I had heard some ridiculous number that even if I quote it now, it's going to sound fake, so I'm doubting either my memory or the number, (laughs) but like 100,000 rounds or something like, I don't know, 50,000 rounds, 100,000, or something obscene that the Glock was still running without malfunction. And that it was so far beyond the test for the Army they were letting it just go and go and go just because they thought it was so much of a novelty to see how how far they could push the Glock to go way beyond where the SIG had already failed. And so we're hearing all this information. To me, it was such a shoe in that SIG was going to win because it was, it was performing 
so much better for the reliability and the accuracy results. Then all of a sudden the announcement comes out during SHOT Show that SIG won. And I couldn't believe it when I heard it, but I guess SIG won. And I couldn't wait to see the results because of everything I'd heard from multiple people that were actually the ones doing the testing in the military. And uh, we found out that the Army never completed the testing. The Army got halfway through the testing and awarded it to SIG. And when the, uh, the Army published the results, and you could see that there's like a chart on or a table, I guess is the best word to say, that where it has all the features down the left side of the table, and then each column is the Glock versus the SIG. You know, it says like ergonomics, you know, excellent and good. You know, accuracy, good and excellent. Like they traded all the way down between good and excellent. And to me, if you were assigning arbitrary point values to the goods and excellence, that seemed like a pretty close tie all the way down for everything. But the Army said, well, since they were so close, uh, we just stopped the testing halfway through and we're awarding it to SIG because SIG was like 25% cheaper. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it's like big amount cheaper. Like 300 million versus 420 million. Like way cheaper for the same amount of handguns. Yeah, it's a big number. So the government's like, hey, they're, they're, yeah, they're testing the same. Uh, they're close enough, so we're not going to finish the testing. We're just going to give it to SIG. Well... People like me were shocked, Glock obviously was shocked, and they protested the decision and tried to say, this is absurd, you, know, you can't just give it to them, we're clearly a better gun, yada, yada, yada. The GAO, which is who oversees the protest, said, no, Glock, your protest was without merit, we're still giving it to SIG. Well, fast forward to last weekend, so I think it was Thursday or Friday, a Dallas PD sent out a... a department-wide notice that said all officers in Dallas PD must immediately stop using the SIG P320. Be and their statement said, SIG has become aware of an issue where the gun is not safe if it's dropped. It'll go off. And they, I read about it first on the firearm blog, and they started talking about how Dallas is recalling these things, and I was in the manual, and I said, I don't know. So I put it on Facebook, is this true? Is, is it really in the SIG manual? This thing will go off if it's dropped? So, of course, after I posted, I go look at SIG's website, and I look at the manuals. This is Friday. I look up their manuals on their website, look up for the P320, and I, I, I'm not kidding. In the table of contents in the owner's manual, there is a listing for dropped pistol. <laughs> And so I go to that page in the table of contents from the manual, and it says, warning, this pistol may fire if dropped. And then I guess they tried to mitigate that by saying, and all pistols can fire if dropped. But you must keep the chamber of the SIG P320 unloaded unless you're actually firing. And they put this in a red box that said warning. And from the firearms attorney standpoint, there's, there's meanings to things in the manual. If you put it in a different color, that means something. If you put the word warning, that means something. You put the word caution or danger, that means something else. So when you're putting something in bright red box that says warning, that's a very big standard of warning to the user that is going to have an effect on the liability concerns later. So let's say somebody gets hurt and tries to sue SIG. SIG has a pretty good opportunity to come back and go, look, we put it in a bright red box that said, warning, don't do this. Therefore, you're an idiot and you did the wrong thing. Well, the problem is if you make the warning so broad, it actually goes the opposite effect. It's not really enforceable at all. You know, so I tell people, what if the car you bought had a warning that said, warning, this car may instantaneously combust into flames when parked. And then they said, and all cars might do that. Might maybe do that. So never have the gas tank with gasoline in it when you park it. If they put that in your car's user manual, they could never say when you tried to sue them when your car caught on fire, they couldn't ever say to the judge, well, Your Honor, we warned them never to have gas in their gas tank because the judge would go, okay, that's unreasonable. You can't just put this blanket warning out there and then when someone violates it, go, ha, 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 you violated the warning, therefore it's all on you. No, I'm of the belief that it is unreasonable for a manufacturer of a defensive handgun to say that you're not allowed. The manufacturer's warning in the manual says don't have the chamber loaded. That means that the vast majority of people out there that are using the SIG P320 as it's supposed to be intended as a defensive handgun 
are actually, by using the gun, are violating a warning from the manufacturer in the manual. Like, to me, that's that, that alone is a huge issue. Does that kind of make sense, Jason? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I, I cannot fathom who decided that was a good warning to put in there. So I put this on Facebook, and some people responded, oh, that's just lawyers trying to CYA. I'm like, actually, no, that's not. I mean, I, of course, okay, I take that back, it is, but that's just not all that is. What that is is really, really poor drafting of a user's manual to say that's the warning. So anyway, um, people said, oh, it was Dallas PD just, you know, reading the manual wrong and getting all upset. So, like, I forget when it was over the weekend, maybe Saturday. SIG came out with a press release that said, our gun is perfectly safe. This is due to Dallas PD relying on an out-of-date manual or an old manual. And... Um, there have been zero instances of the gun firing when dropped in the commercial market. Well, I read that maybe as a regular person, maybe as a lawyer, and said, wait a minute, why are you saying there's been zero instances in the U.S. commercial market? Does that mean there's been instances in the U.S. police and military market? Does that mean there's been instances in foreign markets? Like, well, that's awfully specific. That really rubbed me the wrong way when I read that. So sure enough, uh, yesterday morning, I believe, maybe this morning, I think it was yesterday morning, losing track of time here, uh, it came out that a police officer in Connecticut in January had dropped his gear. He was loading it into his trunk of his car and his gun belt with the holster and the SIG P320 in the holster, locked in the holster, fell to the ground. The gun went off and shot him in the leg. So he had sued SIG on Friday. So August 4th, Friday, he sued them for having a gun that goes off when it gets dropped, which is what they warned about in their user's manual. And to add on top of that, over the weekend, uh, Omaha uh, Outdoors had... Uh, who's a big online seller of guns, had decided to do their own drop test of the SIG. They pulled the bullet and the gunpowder and just used, you know, primers and brass. And they could make their SIGs fire almost every time when they dropped them on the rear of the gun. So they put this video out on YouTube over the weekend. So now you got a video over YouTube on the weekend that shows the SIGs clearly go off almost every single time when you drop them. Now you have what comes to light a police officer in a holster has actually been shot by this thing. And SIG's response on Friday was, no, the gun's perfectly safe. You know, there's been no instances of it. Well, to me as the firearms attorney, now I'm going crazy. Because now not only do they have a safety problem that they've got to be aware of, because this lawsuit, they clearly have to know the lawsuit exists. But now the response is not, you know what? Let's out of a bunch of caution recall these things. Everybody immediately stop using them. Let's get them back out of safety. They're telling people, nope, they're perfectly safe because there's been zero instances in the commercial market. Well, now we know why they used those specific words. Because they knew that in the police market, people have been shot by these things being dropped. So they very carefully said zero instances in the commercial market. To me, that's like the ultimate sin when it comes to product liability because now they've encouraged people, there's no problem, move along, please keep using these things. I mean, Jason, if somebody gets hurt by one of these things today, SIG is going to lose millions of dollars, in my opinion, because they know of the problem. They've, they've been clearly been aware of it. Instead of calling it back and a encouraging people to stop using them, they did the opposite. They encouraged people to keep using them and used very specific words to make it sound like that the gun was perfectly safe. Now... Today, they flew a bunch of the gun bloggers out to their factory in New Hampshire, and the gun bloggers have been putting out news this morning that they met with SIG, and SIG has a fix. And the SIG came out with another press release today that said, we have a voluntary upgrade. They won't call it a recall, but if you'd like your gun to be upgraded, I think they have 500,000 guns out there is what they said, some or 50,000, I forget the number, some crazy number of guns out there that if you want a voluntary upgrade, you can send your gun in. And I kid you not, Jason, they said them to uh, Recoil Magazine, they haven't decided yet whether they're going to charge people for the upgrade or not. Oh, that's crazy. They haven't, even they haven't even decided if they're going to charge you for this or not yet. 
And don't worry, they're gonna come out with the details on the 14th. They're gonna wait an entire week to come out with the details about this voluntary upgrade. So that tells me, I'm picturing lawyer here. Somebody, heaven forbid, gets hurt by this thing and another person gets hurt by this thing. It's gonna be so easy for a court to go to the judge and be like, they knew the problem existed. They did nothing to fix it. Instead of fixing, instead of admitting that a problem, they told everybody it's perfectly safe, keep using it. And then when videos came out showing, and by the way, more after Omaha Outdoors did it, a bunch of other people did it and showed the same exact thing of every gun they tested fires when you drop it. Um, instead of then recalling it, they worried about their image first and brought in all the industry bloggers. Instead of telling the public to stop using them, they brought in the bloggers first. Then they told the bloggers what the plan was. Then they said, wait a week to see. I want to love the company and the people and the products, but man, it makes it really hard when they're, to me, this is a bold statement, it's purely my opinion, but it seems like they're worried more about their government contract because they don't want it to look bad for the army than they are about safety, that they're not recalling it yet. And man, they're gonna get hammered if somebody gets hurt while they knew about it and still didn't recall. And the other thing is in the press release today, they said, we've learned things from the feedback of law enforcement, military and stuff like that that we will like now make available to customers. Which to me invites the question, so you mean you knew of this problem and you didn't make it available to customers until today? It's just, it's very unclear. It's very wishy-washy. Uh, I encourage people on my Facebook page this morning, just cause there's a bunch of people on there. If you haven't followed it yet, please do. Like 10,000 people that follow that and said, if you got a P320, please stop using it until this gets fixed. Um, Jason, just before you and I got on the phone here tonight, I found another video of a guy taking a nylon hammer, you know, like a, a gunsmith's hammer, you know, kind of like a tack hammer, but with a nylon end to uh -huh. it. He took a SIG and took the nylon hammer and tapped it on the rear of the slide and made it fire. Oof. So it's like, this thing's not safe and it's what won the army contract or a version of it. And it's out there. Um, SIG's trying to do the right thing from PR. I don't think they're doing it. Without a doubt, the best answer in my mind immediately would have been, our bad, everyone stop using them, let's fix them, and let's get this solved. Well, sure. Um, what do you think about this? Oh, it's got to be cheaper to recall it than a lawsuit, like you said. I mean, and, and that's just it. Nobody wants to put a bad name on a gun. You know, we... We have enough struggles as far as guns go. <laughs> I want my gun to be safe. Well, just like I told you with the trigger tech trigger, I bolted up the old stock and smashed it on the ground just to make sure it wasn't going to fire. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's crazy. So, so we have too many topics. We didn't get to them tonight. We need to cut it cut it off here. We've been going for an hour. Um, next time, Jason, if you're available, I hope you are. I'd love to talk about the new CZ P10C. Um, I'm kind of in love with that gun. Oh, it looks uh, awesome. C CZ is actually sending me one. So here's another care package. They're, they're, they're sending me one to try out to take care of. So I'm going to abuse it let you guys know. Um, older news is the Canadian sniper shot, that record they have. That Fox News was awesome to call me and interview me for. It was a good <laughs> good boost for book sales for me. Um, to, to see my name on Fox News, it was kind of cool. We could talk about that. And man, I wanted to talk about like four or five things for compliance and Rocket FFL with you, but I think we just ran out of time. It's all right. Many topics for next time. All right. Well, sounds good. I appreciate everyone tuning in. Apologies for the delay since last podcast, but you officially can't complain anymore because you're listening to one now. Uh, check out the Long Range Shooting Handbook. Uh, check out Rocket FFL to get your FFL to get into business. I have a new venture starting. I'm hesitant to tell you the name of it yet, but it's going to get you an online concealed weapons permit that's valid in over half the country, completely online. No having to go to find a place to take a class. Uh, no having to do a shooting test. No any of that. Uh, it's the coolest loophole I found in the law, and I'm going to help you guys exploit it. And uh, no matter where you live, get this CCW. Jason, anything you got to say till next time? Uh, no, I think we're good. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everybody.